What's up my friend, welcome back to another video and today I want to go over five fundamental tips to help you create a virtual orchestra that actually sounds convincing and realistic. Um, the topic of virtual orchestration and how to actually make it sound good is like a world of its own, honestly. There's so much we could cover, but you know, in the context of a YouTube video, I think it's important that we really nail down the fundamentals and what really, really makes a difference. So I kind of chose five of the most important things in my opinion that will help you make your mock-up sound great. And I want to share that with you today in a case study type of video where I'll show you one of my tracks. I'll go through each of those points and demonstrate them in this piece. So it all kind of makes sense. Uh, before we really do that though, I want to give you something free to start things off. I call this my orchestration essentials guide. And inside, I want to share with you my step-by-step -step framework of how I approach every single idea I have from the initial like melodic idea or harmonic idea all the way to the completed master. And this is the exact framework I follow with every single piece I write. Um, it's super valuable. It's helped a ton of my students already. And I want to give it to you as a gift for watching this video. So if you want to click the first link in the description box, it'll take you over to there, uh, the, the site where you can download it absolutely free. And again, it's my gift to you for checking out this video today. Uh, if you implement that, implement the material, um, honestly, it'll be so valuable and it'll just give you a lot of clarity in every single piece and mock-up that you approach. So without further ado, let's kind of dive in. Uh, the first core component, honestly, I think is to start off with good sample libraries. Okay. You know, on this library, oh, sorry, on this channel, I talk a lot about um, how having the best sample libraries or buying as many sample libraries as you want is not necessarily the answer to good orchestral mockups, right? But that being said, there is something to be said about having good libraries to start with. You don't want to just buy like a $20 library uh, that is not deeply sampled, that doesn't have the proper articulations, that doesn't have the right tone that fits your piece of music that you're trying to evoke certain emotions from, you know? So let's say the context of the piece is a more emotional, more of a melodic ballad type of piece, right? And maybe you'll want legato strings, you want smooth woodwinds and brass and you know warm textures throughout. Well, you're probably gonna want libraries that suit that context very well. So you want to start with a good set of tools so that you don't have to fit like fiddle and edit MIDI forever, you know, to just try just to try to make it sound convincing. So for example, this piece of music here called Love's Rapture, um, it's it's again, it's a more emotional type of piece. And I knew I wanted libraries that played really beautiful legato, had some dynamic range to it, and just has a very expressive approach overall. So let me just play this uh this passage here for you. Um it's the kind of the louder section of the piece, the climax with the with the theme. And then I'll go over one of the libraries that really makes this come to life. So have a quick listen. All right, so there we go. So yeah, in terms of the the melody here, it's it's very high. It kind of it soars, right? And what instrumental ensemble is being utilized here? Well, mainly the high strings, right? So mainly the violins one, violins two, and then the other strings are supporting them and enhancing the overall melody. So to get this sort of smooth melodic texture, you need a library that has good dynamic range, a very expressive approach, like expressive performances, lots of vibrato, and also uh, just very smooth legato in general. Um, so a library that does this very well is Cinematic Studio Strings by Cinematic Studio Series. So if just the violins one patch, the legato articulation sounds like this. So out of the box, it has a very beautiful sound and every note is basically dripping with emotion there. So for me, that type of library fits this piece very well. Um, whereas if I use something a little, you know, different, like let's say Tokyo Scoring Strings by Impact Soundworks, they, they do have some emotional performances in those samples, but it's meant more of 
as like kind of like a drier library, more for the exciting shorts, you know, they, they really excel in those shorter articulations. Um, whereas Cinematic Studio Strings is really beneficial for these type of slower melodic pieces. So having a good fundamental base in your library selection is so, so important. And I can I cannot um, recommend that highly enough. So that, that would be my step number one is start with a good set of libraries for your piece. Step number two would then be to make sure you choose the right instruments and also the right articulations for your piece. So, you know, my, my melody here, right? Uh, da, 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 da. I knew I wanted it super high and I knew I wanted it within that octave as well. So I was thinking like, what type of instruments could pull off that type of emotion in that type of range, right? In that register. And a couple of instruments came to mind, like for the strings, we have violins. Um, for the, uh, for the woodwinds, we have like flute, we have clarinet, you know, we have oboe for the brass, we have like trumpets and maybe French horns that can kind of reach up there a little bit. And then for the percussion, you know, you have some tinkling tonal percussion that can also play that. But I knew I wanted something more legato, uh, more lyrical. So percussion may not be the right instrument here because is, uh, percussion instruments typically have a larger attack and then they kind of fade off. Right. So in this case, I knew I wanted that classic timeless sound. And for me, when I think of that vibe, I think of strings. So that's why I went with violins for this melody. But in addition to that, I also knew I wanted um, a little more breath to the to the me melody. You know, I knew I knew I wanted the violin's texture, but I wanted to feel a little fuller as well. So in, in addition, I layered the flute in there too. So if I play that one more time here, um, you get a sense of what that sounds like. Let's play the violins one. and what layer in the flute as well. So you can hear the violins one playing the melody, but the flute is also in there as well. Take away the violins. Right, adds a nice human breathy texture. Remove the flute. Nice, nice violin sound, but combine them together. It, it's fuller, it's more buttery, you know, and it stands out further in the mix. And with these longer types of melodies, right, you, you want to make sure you choose the right articulation. Like legato is the typical go-to here. You want to make sure you're not using sustain uh, patches just because those are polyphonic. So you can play multiple notes at once. And most of them do not have built-in legato transitions, which enable you to go from one note to another and uh, trigger that legato sample, you know, that, that makes it makes that transition sound really smooth and natural. So choosing the right articulations for the context is super important. Like if you have a super fast action piece, right? Most likely you want to use staccato, staccatissimo, or spiccato. You probably don't want to use a, like a sustain patch and then just repeat that over and over because the attack is not going to be as sharp as you want it. And the release sample is not going to be as uh, clean as you want either. So the right articulations for the right context is step number two, because the real life performers, like real musicians, they will know how to play certain lines and in certain contexts. Whereas for us, we're working with virtual instruments and these are just pre-recorded instruments, right? Uh, in sample form. So we have to be the conductor and we have to choose uh, which articulations are appropriate for what we're trying to achieve in our music. So again, choosing the right instruments for the tone, the timbre, the octave, the register, and also the corresponding articulations for the context are very, very important. So that would be step number two. Okay, step number three would then be to use good voice leading. And this step is particularly useful for uh, pieces that have more voices, that have different parts that are playing different notes, especially when you're transitioning from chord to chord to chord. Um, if you, let's say you have a typical progression like one, six, uh, four or five, if you're going from the one chord to the six chord, you probably don't want every single note stepping down a third, right? Then stepping down a four, uh, another third to the, to the four chord, then maybe going up a step to the five chord. You probably want to use some common tones. You want to choose good positioning that will allow the chords to flow smoothly from one to another instead of feeling like they're jumping back and forth. So especially in these ballad types of contexts where there's longer lines, let me show you this MIDI here. You can see that I've tried to keep the lines basically as smooth as possible. Uh, let me get rid of this modulation data. Um, so yes, the melody up here is in the violins one, right? Da, 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 da. But then these inner voices, you can see that I've tried to keep them relatively smooth. I, it might be easier to see if we just take a look at one track at a time here. So this is the violins one, here's the melody, but you can see there's a certain shape to that as well, right? 
um, very melodic and uh, very easy to sing as well. Take a look at Violence 2. It basically accompanies Violin 1 and it makes them uh, feel more cohesive together. Then we take a look at Violas. So here, it's not jumping that much, right? It, it, it kind of goes up a step, down a step, goes up a third, maybe it jumps a fourth, but that kind of comes back down. Take a look at the cello, similar kind of thing here. These lines are pretty much going by step right here, goes up a step. So it's it's kind of using good voice leading to connect smooth tone, chord tones together so that the chords don't sound like they're jumping all over the place. So if we have a quick listen to this, maybe we'll solo up all the strings. Take a look at the MIDI. So there's some melodic lines there, right? Some counter melodies in the violas. Cello going up, sinking back down by step. Violas kind of doing their counter melody there. Right, and if this seems at all overwhelming, for me, the best way to approach this is to think from the perspective of the performer themselves. Uh, like if you were to think of each part horizontally one at a time, then you could start to think like, what would be enjoyable for the performer to play? Would it be more fun for them to kind of go up by step or up by skips and then back down and then back up, you know, over and over again? Or would it be nicer to play melodic lines that are smooth and actually feel like they could be their own melody? Well, obviously in this type of context, the latter would be more of the case. So if you think of that type of perspective, think from the performer's perspective, like what would they enjoy playing, then write kind of for them at the same time, making sure that the line fits harmonically with the rest of the ensemble, then you have a much higher chance of writing a line that feels natural and flows smoothly from one chord to the next. And this is how you create beautiful counter melodies and you know textures that just flow beautifully while the melody's going on. Um, you can just have fun with it. And there really is no set rule, but making sure you have good voice leading, thinking like SATB style, going from one chord to the no another very smoothly with good voice leading, using inversions if you have to, sus chords, whatever that may be. Um, it, it just gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility there. So I would definitely recommend using good voice leading in these types of contexts, especially. Okay, the next step is to use the mod wheel or volume, right? And maybe that's expression as well. But typically you wanna use your mod wheel because there are contexts where every instrument is not playing at the same dynamic, right? Even within one instrument itself, like let's say the violin's one, if they're playing a more emotional context, especially, you probably want to activate the softer dynamics, but you also want the medium dynamics and the forte dynamics, the ones that really soar high and really sound emotional. If you don't have that, then it sounds pretty lifeless and there's uh, you know, quite a static performance going on. So let me play this part one more time for you, get a sense of what that melody sounds like, so. Now crescendos, hits that peak, and then it tapers down to end off this phrase. And now crescendo, let's take a look at that modulation data. Dips down here, crescendo, right? And then comes back down, ends the phrase, rise back up. And it settles down. And this is really cool because usually libraries are mapped this way. Um, the, the, the modulation wheel on your keyboard will typically be triggering the different dynamic layers that the library is recorded with. So let's say for Cinematic Studio Strings, which is what this violence patches, uh, Violence 1 patches from, I think it comes with four or five dynamic layers. So the very bottom of the mod wheel, it's very, very, very quiet. Whereas at the very top, they're at their searing fortissimo dynamic, right? So I, I wanna trigger those different dynamic layers, maybe not all the way, right? Like here's the start of the melody. I definitely want them to have a huge crescendo into the main theme, but you can see here for the rest of the main theme, I'm not really going above like, let's say 75% of the way there to the top, and I'm not dipping below, let's say 50 or 30, 40%, uh, because I want that melody to still be present um, all the way through and stand out in the mix. But I'm still triggering those different dynamic layers and it provides that dynamic contrast that you don't get if you don't trigger the mod wheel at all. One little side note here is you can see how closely matched 
the modulation data is to the shape of the melody as well. So the higher you go with the melody, naturally the more emotion that's being inputted into the live performance. So you can simulate that using your mod wheel. Da, 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 da. Then it dips down, then it rises up again as the, uh, the, the melody rises up. You know, overall it comes down, rises back up again. So does the modulation, comes down, rises up, and then all the way back down as the phrase ends, you know? And this is not something that is um, certainly obvious at the very beginning. I think it becomes more intuitive as you play more expressively and you think more melodically in general. Um, when the mod will becomes more second nature to you, especially as a pianist, then when you do these, um, it, it just makes the entire line feel much more expressive. So using that modulation wheel, using volume and expression to your advantage can be so, so important uh, to really make your performance sound lifelike and actually have emotion in it, you know? So that would be step number four. Fifth and finally is the use of volume balance, making sure that all the instruments are sitting at the appropriate volumes across the board. So what that means is as you're arranging your piece of music, you wanna make sure that the melodic components, the, the most important instruments that are supposed to be protruding in the mix, those ones are the loudest relative to the other instruments, right? If they're not, then the melody is gonna be hidden in the mix. Whereas if a harmonic instrument, let's say, you know, my tuba, for example, that one is just outlining the foundation of the orchestra. It's outlining the bass notes, it's showing what the chords are. If that's too loud, then our ear starts to pay attention to that, and that's obviously not the melody, so that can throw the listener off. So let me show you that example. If I took the violins one and turned it down, so for example, it made it really soft. then you really now only hear the flute, right? And then let's turn, let's turn up the tuba on the bottom. Hear how loud that tuba is on the bottom? It's all not lining the bass, but at the same time, it's really making the, the low end pop up, and that's not necessarily what we want. So we just want to make sure that every instrument is serving a unique purpose, and in terms of priority, we know exactly what we want each instrument to have. So for example, the violins one in this uh, theme, the priority is like a 10 out of 10. I really want it to show, it's very, very important. So I wanna make sure that that is not hidden by anything else. In fact, I layered it with a flute to not only add that texture, but maybe make it slightly louder as well. Whereas the tube at the bottom, in terms of priority, that's at about a three or four out of 10 because it serves an important role in terms of outlining the harmony, but how much do I actually want it to be heard? Very, very little. I want it to be more felt and I want it to support the ensemble more than being audible in the mix as much. So that for me would be a three or four priority and I would tuck that a little bit under. So what you wanna to do to ensure that all the volume balances are, are correct is after your arrangement is complete, then you go and do what's called a static mix. So I like to take all of my tracks, I like to drag all the faders down to the very bottom so that you can't hear anything and then starting with the most important instrument, I drag that one up first to let's say about minus 10 dB. Doesn't really matter as long as it's quiet enough and it doesn't clip at the very top. Then once that instrument is brought up and that's the core element, then I start bringing up every single instrument around that, um, balancing the volumes accordingly, making sure the lead instrument is not being covered up, making sure every instrument is sitting in its appropriate volume place. And then you can also do the panning and everything else like that pre-mix EQ, whatever you need to do to make sure the mix is prepped and ready to go. So volume balancing is so, so important as well. And just making sure that you approach it from that standpoint is, is uh, you know, just so, so crucial. So I would highly recommend you go through that as well. So just to quickly recap the five steps, number one is to start with good libraries. Um, it's very easy to choose libraries that don't fit the context of your project and then you're kind of struggling to make them work. Um, so we definitely want to avoid that frustration by just equipping ourselves with the right tools for the job. That's number one. Number two is to choose the right instruments for the job. So if it's a high part, maybe choose the violins or a flute or a trumpet, and then also choose the right articulations accordingly to create um, that type of image or that illusion that you're trying to create, right? If it's a long line, long melodic line, probably you're going to choose legato and uh, probably not polyphonic sustains or staccato or anything, right? 
So choosing the right articulations is so crucial as well. Step number three is to use good voice leading to make sure you transition from chord to chord very smoothly, especially if it's a more melodic context and there's more uh, inner lines going on in counterpoint. You want to think from the perspective of the performers and make sure that what they're playing is actually enjoyable. Um, step number four is to use that volume and modulation to really use those dynamic layers, take advantage of the musicality that the libraries have to offer, and really make those performances sound expressive. And then finally, number five is to make sure your volume balances are all correct. And uh, this is, again, what you want to do after your arrangement is complete. Drag all the faders down, start with the most important element, drag it up, and then balance everything else around it to make sure that every instrument has its place. You can pan it as well, um, prepare your mix for the uh, the balancing phase and you know all the processing and stuff that's to come after that. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, these are five of the most important tips in my opinion that really make our virtual instruments and orchestrations come to life. Um, I follow these every single time when I'm working on a piece. You know I'm always listening. I'm always trying to ask myself like what could be improved. Uh, what's maybe standing out, like what could I fix to make it sound more realistic and just really evoke the emotions, the passions that I'm trying to get across with this piece of music. And if those warning signs don't pop up anymore, then I know that my mix is complete or I know that my arrangement is good, you know? So you, you can kind of use that as a little guideline as well. But yeah, if, if you're, you know, kind of working on your own productions and your mock-ups at the moment and you're not entirely confident or you're just not very happy with how they're turning out at the moment. Again, I want to give you my orchestration essentials guide in case, you know, you are having those arrangements that maybe feel a bit muddy or a little bit static sometimes, and they're just not really coming to life. Um, this guide will basically give you some tips and a framework on how to approach orchestrations in general and think about orchestration in a slightly clear and simple way. And again, it goes through my start to finish approach that I use every single time. So I want to give it to you absolutely free. You can click the first link in the box below to take you straight there and uh, you can grab it as my gift to you. So thank you so much. I'll catch you in the next video and take care. Bye-bye.